this, this point about nostalgia, it's, it's, it's common right now. And I think yeah. perhaps everyone agrees that there is no like, offensive, progressive project for the left in terms okay. of nostalgia. And I think it's interesting that in, in terms of your discussion, that the, the right-wing populists in Sweden, when they play nostalgic music, it's yeah. not right-wing music. It's leftist music from the 70s. Right. That was nostalgic for a period before the 70s, when we were supposed to be okay. happy. But, but on the other hand, this acceleration in neoliberal modern culture yeah. doesn't seem to offer, like this, this point that Per Anderson made, that it, it offers endless variations, so therefore there's not a progressive project either. No, I could totally, right, yeah. So, so what's the temporality that we should shoot for here? It's like no, I think, that's the, I think that's a really good way of getting to the problem, exactly. And also, the, there's, there's, an advantage we, there's an advantage there, I think, that... that the left, or whatever that would be, has, which it isn't taking, um, which it which isn't, isn't aware of, as it were. Because I mean, this, is, this is partly why I think it's important to bang on about this stuff. That it is, it's crucial to, to say neoliberalism has not delivered on what it, on what it promised. Okay? The neo, neo, neoliberalism does not deliver us a future any more convincingly than, than the left does. And... Um, you know that's 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 a weakness. That's a weakness. There's a, there's a rhetoric, um, there's a rhetoric, and there's a kind of simulation of endless novelty and innovation. But as you said, that really that that what that amounts to is just um, permutations of the already familiar. Um, in terms of what we sh what we should shoot for, um, you know, this this is this is the space, isn't it? That, that, that I mean, uh, uh, there's no easy answer to that. Um, what is clear is that I think what is clear is that that certainly after two thousand and eight with the bank bailouts, um, the, the neoliberal right no longer has uh, uh, the grip on modernisation or the notion of the of the modern that it had before then. Um, it looks defunct, um, but then everything else is defunct as well. It's a strange situation where every single political ideology is dilapidated and sort of derelicted. Um, but I think that, I know, you can learn from neoliberalism in that, um, you know, neoliberalism didn't just start in the 70s, as, as I'm sure you know. I mean, it started in the 40s, 50s, um, Hayek or whatever. You know, wait, waited a long time. Uh, until the moment was right and it, it, could, um, it could take control. And the other key lesson we can learn from neoliberalism is that the way that the impossible became the inevitable. That's what's interesting about capitalist realism. That, okay, so capitalist realism, this is the, the only realistic model is this neoliberal model. It, it certainly was not realistic in the 50s or indeed the 70s. You know, the, it, was, it was ludicrous. If you'd, if you'd have said to people in the streets in the UK in the 70s, well, in ten years, the miners will be defeated. You know, uh, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, uh, coal, you know, steel, telecoms. All of that will be denationalised. It just sound like a ludicrous scenario, which no one would have believed. Yet, yet it happened. You know, and that how how has it happened? Well, it, how was that able to happen? Well, be, well, it's partly because of structural shifts in capitalism, which we talked about in terms of the move to to post fordism. Um, but it's also partly that they had the neoliberals had a story prepared, which they could helicopter in when things went wrong, as it were. And um, <coughs> you can learn from that anticipation that some that it's sort of theoretical production is is an imaginative production is what is needed at the moment. I think in a way, like um, we we don't ourselves know what we want things to look like if we're honest. I mean, I think we can you know we can be fairly clear that. What we don't like, uh, as it uh, as it were, and um, you know, certainly in the UK at the moment, what we don't like is getting worse and worse and more and more intense at the moment. Um, but I, you know, so that's just what, as I said at the start, it's not capitalist realism. Is something that other people have and we don't have. I don't think we have as well, and, and it, that that it, you know that it disables our ability to think about um, what an alternative would look like. But it's, it, it, and this isn't just. Um, and I, and I don't think this is a contingent kind of, um, it's just a contingent thing to do with cultural ideology in the last 30 years, although that is a massive part of it. And I think here, here maybe is a connection with 
speculative realism and some of the ideas are coming out of those um, thinkers is, you know, particularly Ray Brassier, I think, is the cognitive dimension of things like property. Um, um, some of my um, younger comrades, uh, Alex Williams and um, Nick Srikek, who I've worked with, and, um, have come up with this like, notion of folk politics, um, which they derive from um, neurophilosophers, um, the, the Churchlands, who um, have this idea of, of folk psychology. Basically, folk psychology is um, it's, it's a much disputed concept, and um, many people dismiss the idea that it even exists. But let's just, just not let's not worry about that for the moment. That, that um, folk psychology is is, is is really the sort of beliefs that the, 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 the as it were apparently spontaneous belief that people have got that they've got a self that they have things like feelings, emotions, will, etc. Um, and you know the Churchians argue well this you know this is you know this is akin to ideas about witches or you know demons that people used to have in former times uh, th th in that there's no neurological basis for these things actually and that something like a feeling or emotion is just a vague way of speaking about neurochemical events that you know um, and I'm not asking to buy into that by that theory um, necessarily um, but I think what we <sighs> What we can see is a problem about this issue around um, the folk in terms of capitalism. Why, well, okay, why? What do I mean by that? Well, that you can't see capital, <laughs> evidently. You can't see it. Um, that this is part of the reason that um, the anger around the bank bailouts found it difficult to have an object, as it were. Um, because, you know, you can't. You could, <sighs> We can see that we can see we can see particular individuals. We can understand or think we can understand the failings of particular individuals. We can attribute things to um, you know to to, uh, to biographical individuals. Uh, you know we, we can't see we can't see capital at all. You know and, and in particular in the UK with its tradition of um, plain jumble common sense empiricism. If you can't bloody see it or touch it, it doesn't exist. You know, all of you know, particularly with um, particularly with that, then um, you know, it, 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 capital is a massive advantage in terms of folk categories. I would argue, and because you know, because it, it, it doesn't appear at this level of um, it doesn't appear on this ordinary level of um, phenomenal experience. You know, we, that um, yet nevertheless, we can see that nothing is clearer than that, than the fact that. This um, um, hyper abstract entity, um, which you know has no sensual properties whatsoever, um, was you know uh, has caused a catastrophe in the world. You know that um, this 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 is we 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 sort of. We're living this disjunct, aren't we? Where we, we sort of think, well, um, in terms of our everyday life, we have a set of categories that make sense or seem to make sense, and we, that we can operate with. Yeah, in terms of the broad frame of, you know, that the, what gives sort of social life consistency now and what can affect it, you know, we can only account for this in terms of something which does not appear at that level at all. You know, which, which is capital. Um, so, and you know those categories like you know the individual, like volition, individual volition, like responsibility, um, play into the agenda of the neoliberal right very easily, don't they? Because the, you know the um, and but there's a further kind of I say kind of the cognitive issue there, like that. Um, what well, that means is not, it's not only the conceptual problem, it's also about tactics and strategy. Mm. Like, where do you aim at then? Where do you aim at if you're, if you're, if you're wanting to attack capitalism? Well, particularly this uh, post-Fordist finance capitalism. Where is it? What are the, I mean, in the you know, previous forms of capitalism, you could have disputes, you know, with, when, when, a mine, when a miner's, you know, when a, when a miner's brought down, um, 
uh, Tory government in the 70s in, in the UK, um, they were able to do that because you could attack, you know, certain, um, uh, you know, certain resources. You remove those resources, remove labour. There's there's a problem. You know, there's a there's a uh, it's much harder now. Yeah. Wouldn't you say that actually the main problem is how activities uh, like today and the way they kind of brutal individualism that you have mentioned that that is um, everywhere that it makes it so difficult. Because we do have a degree of freedom, maybe a freedom to you know have our blogs or yeah. our sites or have our own modes of expression that kind of shape our own identity and yeah. in that produce a certain kind of uh, attention and you know and that you that's what you kind of say and that you are not willing. One is very difficult maybe to put, uh, to give up. Yes. That and, uh, and that's, I think, maybe one of the difficulties that makes people to come together, even though I guess now people are coming together in some ways, but I think, and I think artists or musicians are mm. kind of pragmatic subject in the sense that they are at the top of this kind of individual reflection of individual reflection of oneself and right. individual qualities that you can experience only to these people. So, yeah, I think the notion of subjectivity is where the main problem lies, at least that's what I think. Yeah, yeah but I, mean, I, I, I think that's intertwined, aren't they? The, 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 the two issues are completely intertwined, aren't they, as it were? But, um, I mean, this is the, I think what, the, the objective irony of capital, I think, is part of what, what you're talking about. I, 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 I don't want to re-describe what you're saying, but how I'd... Um, maybe think about that is in terms of, um, well, what I mean by the objective irony of capital? Well, um, as it were, communism has to propagandize for itself. You know, capital sells, that's capital. You know, that that's the way it can respond to anything, as it were. Uh, that, and in terms of, I mean, it doesn't even, and now we ourselves, have, since we ourselves are so invested in selling ourselves, um, and like you say, we in the um, cultural industries, the so-called creative industries, are the, the, the vanguard of this um, this kind of uh, um, entrepreneurial subjectivity. You know, you just, um, it won't survive. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I don't exist in that Fordist world, of the crumbling Fordist world of the, the British Academy. Um, you know, I, I haven't got any. Of, all my contracts are short-term contracts. Um, which means I, exactly, I, I have to engage in this frenzied kind of entrepreneurialism, selling myself, etc., uh, at all times. And um, <sighs> yes, I think that absolutely is part of it. But I, I don't think it's opposed to what I was saying. I think it's part of this overall kind of uh, overall matrix, as it were. Um, that I mean, this is the thing about like the folk. I think is the folk is that not something only dupes believe in and only idiots believe in and that sophisticated people can believe in something else. Um, the work of Thomas Metzinger, I think, it's really important in this respect. You know, Metzinger, Metzinger um, wrote a book called Being No One um, a few years ago. He's, he's a kind of newer philosopher. And he's, um, Metzinger's argument is basically that uh, is, people attack him going, oh, Metzinger, everyone's said this before, there's nothing new about it. But I think that there is something new about what he's saying, actually. He's saying, look, there's, there's no such thing as a self. This just follows on from people like the Churchlands who'd argue, look, if you look in the world, you know, for, for, for a material thing which corresponds to our idea of the self, you'll find, you won't find anything, okay? Um, what we do have, what, what we call a self, Metzinger says, is really a process which misrecognizes itself as a thing. So uh, this, this kind of uh, Marxist reification, as it were, is almost a neurological, uh, 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 happens at the level of neurology for, for, for um, for Metzinger, so uh, that you know, as it were, our neurological processes reify themselves. <laughs> they, you know, the, um, th they almost prefer, perform this act of ideology themselves. You know, which that you know, uh, Louis Althusser famous he, he said that you know that uh, what does ideology do? It produces subjects. You know, that it produces subjects by interpolation. Um, that that as it were, that this kind of that's what I mean. There's this meshing, as it were, between a, a, um, 
kind of folk, folk ideologies which emerge and, 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 and a political ideology or political economic ideology of, um, uh, of capitalism specifically. Um, and um, so Metz Metzinger's argument is not then, okay, well, that's it then. I, Thomas Metzinger, uh, oh, Thomas, you can't, you know, people go, oh, you, well, why do you even call yourself I, then, Thomas, if you, don't, if you know that you don't exist? Because he, well, part of what he's saying is you can't just opt out of this. But, you know, even if you know that such a th there's no such thing as a self, you'll still have to keep operating as, as if there is one, as it were. Um, and you can just do one more thing and then please come back. Um, that, um, what I w wanted to say about Ben is about um, the things like property, I think, operate in a similar way. That um, issues to do with property, uh, it, this is a cognitive category. You know, that a, co a cognitive category that, um, you know, when, when John Lennon says, imagine no possessions, it is very hard to do in lots of ways. It is, it is very, very hard to step out of um, framing the world in terms of property, etc. It's uh, like um, you know Kant's notion of a uh, transcendental categories, the categories which precede experience and which uh, form experience and frame experience. And uh, property is a quasi-transcendental category like that for us. So it's not only that we, it's not only that we can't identify an enemy capital which we can. Um, easily overcome, uh, or which we can, we can personalise or anthropomorphise in such a way as that we can overcome it. It's not only that we've got that problem, it's that also that the structures that we're fighting against are internalised in us, and I think at a deeper level of what you were saying is that, you know, that, that, that we, it's ourselves that are, are required to be dismantled in a fundamental way. Um, and, you know, this is why Marx is saying, this is the difference, uh, well, Marx is saying that you know the proletariat fundamentally wants to abolish itself, and that's and that's what's different from you know other kinds of identity-based politics, which would want to assert certain kind of uh, identities. That you know this is about liquidation or elimination, so that um, you know there's this move in um, philosophy, um, you know this uh, movement in philosophy called eliminative materialism, and people like Metzinger and um, the Churchlands are you know, said to belong to that. What, what do they mean by eliminative materialism? They mean that, you'd, that what the Churchlands hope for is that, in the end, we'd get rid of the lang language of, uh, we get rid of this whole set of categories like emotions, feelings, selves even, and replace it with, for them, an ac accurate scientific account of what's going on at a neurological level. Um, now, Again, I'm not saying you should buy this. But what I'm saying is that there's, there's an, at least an analogy with what is required, I think, for a successful communist project or a post-capitalist project. I prefer the term post-capitalist to communist for lots of levels. Um, is th that will require an el eliminative project. We'll have to eliminate categories which are so fundamental to us. Um, and, you know, th this is not easy, despite what John Lennon said. You know, that... Um, uh, and, and again, I think that's there, there is also this question of, of strategy where we're, where we're aiming at now because of the um, the distributed nature of, of capital. So capital becomes more and more um, ethereal, as it were, less and less based on um, particular kind of spatial, temporal locations. You know, sorry, do you want to come back in? Um, Yes. One of the capitalists now, so it's um, yep, and yep. That's a problem <laughs> no, the collective pride, but like if, if you're not successful when it's your own, the, the bank crisis was as much yours and mine. It was no, absolutely, our, our but, but, but I think that's absolutely correct. And um, so I think what's happening there is um, uh, folk economics as well as folk politics, actually. What happens is people feel on an individual level guilty because they have spent too much on their credit cards in their mind. Uh, in the UK, they get this uh, idiotic mantra from Cameron, uh, you know, of this, uh, well, you know, if you keep spending money, you have to, you know, at some point, you have to pay it back. You know, and um, uh, that's, this makes sense for people because they, 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 they have spent a lot of money on their credit cards. Why have they spent a lot of money on their credit cards? Because they're morally decadent and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, no, big one, because they, as I said before, they need to spend the money in order to make up their wages, which are lacking. 
And secondly, because if they didn't spend the money, the economy would have collapsed. Because you know, consumerism, uh, consumer capitalism requires people to be indebted. You know, so the, the, the whole category of personal guilt and responsibility is completely irrelevant here, but, but it is played upon. You know, and that, that, that is precisely, precisely the case. I did want to mention one other thing, which is when you mentioned that thing about um, uh, nostalgia for old, uh, right-wing nostalgia for left-wing music, this, this was happened to Cameron. You know, Cameron said that um, he really liked the jam. This was a famous thing, you know, that, you know, the, the, uh, Eaton Rifles. You know, a song about public school boys. Uh, you know, in in in, in, uh, in the UK, yeah, uh, he really likes it. You know, it's, it's a whole other dimension of capitalist realism. That what's you know what's on Cameron's iPod. You know, and it just it, it shows the level of contempt they can have for things, as it were. Now, it's just aesthetics. Culture is just aesthetics. It doesn't have, doesn't you know, uh, we can just uh, consume all this stuff, whatever it meant in its original form, and. You know, this is why I start with that image of the start of capitalist realism with the British Museum. So, I mean, an irony of capital. That capital reduces, you know, re removes the ability to believe in things. That's what it, that's what it does. That, you know, something like the, the, the British Museum is what, like, is, is what Earth looks like from the extraterrestrial perspective of capital as this science fictional entity. You know, look, it's like it's laid out on a spaceship, isn't it? This is the stuff that people believed. But you can't, like, you know, the, we, but we don't believe. That's the implicit thing, isn't it? And of course, because you can't, you know, because this is, capital doesn't believe in anything. Uh, that it can solicit beliefs, particular beliefs, to its own end. But capital itself, you know, has, that, that, that is the genius of capital. That it has no specific commitments to anything. You know, religions, they've got, you know, they can wriggle and, and, and move around and change things, but only within a certain bandwidth. Capital is not committed to any kind of belief whatsoever. You know, there's no, no, no beliefs. And that's why you can have... <sighs> any world you can imagine, can be, there can be a capitalist version of it, right? You know, that's, it's not tied down to uh, a particular set, set of beliefs in that way. Um, and that's why um, I compare it to, you know, that, that theologian Alvin Plantinga has this idea of trans-world depravity. Basically, what Plantinga is trying to do was uh, account... There's a problem in uh, philosophy of religion, you know, which be, you'll be familiar with. The problem of evil, you know, it says, if God's so good and so powerful, um, why does he allow there to be evil and suffering in the world? Well, Plantinga says, well, it's basically it's down to free will of human beings and that whatever world human beings were in, uh, the evil would emerge be just because human beings are in it. So, so uh, that's what he means by trans world depravity. And capitalism is similar to that. What, you know, whatever world there is, Capital can emerge out of it, you know, um, and I think this um, actually relates to. Um, I think that the, the real strengths of um, Deleuze and Guattari's theories of, of capitalism, which I still think is one of the most sophisticated theories, really. Um, but you know, what 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 is it that de defines capitalism is not nothing positive. Um, but that it is really to do with the decoding of all pr other previous. Um, social regimes, a kind of radical desacralization. Um, that, uh, you know, that, as it were, that, you know, reli religious, sacred, or, so or societies based on the sacred, you know, are committed to particular sets of axioms which they really can't remove. Capitalism can, in theory, take away anything. Um, of course, it, it can't completely remove everything and carry on. It, it removes things and then it puts other things in its place, as it were. And that's, that's partly accounts for the strange temporality in which we now live, which was where I was before the break, I think, which was this... Um, why you can have, as it were, the leading edge of kind of techno... Um, and technological development, um, radical shifts in... Um, radical, radical sh shifts at every level in um, science and technology, you know, unprecedented um, changes in, you know, that, 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 you know, something like genetic engineering, which we can take for granted now, but, you know, this is the capacity of, a, you know, an animal to enter into its, the abstract code of its own, you know, production. This is, you know, this is big stuff. Um, that, you know, you can have that alongside, you know, the most, you know, n reactionary, uh, 
you know, the most reactionary, atavistic throwbacks. You know, and that, you know, this is what Deleuze, this is what Deleuze and Guattari argue will will be the key defining feature of capitalist culture that it combines futurism with archaism, and this is this is what we're living now. So what, you know, so what we're living, and I think the UK is the sums this up more than anything else. You know, uh, that's uh, you know, where you've you've got these as it were diff sedimented temporalities and cultures. You know, ridiculous kind of bourgeois aristocratic royal family along you know along. And the, you know, the miserable spectacle of the royal wedding in a few weeks, you know, alongside you know, um, you know, being a leading edge of, of, of finance capital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that these kind of um, cyber gothic compounds are, are, are kind of you know just what you'd just what to, to, you know you'd expect capitalism to be like, uh, according to um, Deleuze and Guattari, really. Um, but would you yeah, say yeah. that these two? trajectories of uh, the full psychology of, of, of yeah. selfhood, yep. sort of drawing on Metzinger and where yeah. that could go, and, uh, and the trajectory of, of capitalist development up until becoming ubiquitous uh, are yeah. intertwined or the same trope? No, I don't think they're into I think that... And then further on, would... would yeah. Because there is a there is a there is a movement to both of those uh, tropes or la uh, trajectories, as it's, as it seemed that, I mean, you said that Althusser speaks of our interpolation. Yes. Uh, or the, the state interpolates its subjects. Yes. Because those those things are, are are present at a level that we cannot even question. So. Because yes. It operates. Uh, on a level that we take for granted, yes. and that's why we keep on calling ourselves I, yes. as Metzinger has uh, yeah. approached with. But then, because in Marxist theory and development of, of, of theory around capital, I guess it's very strongly, it draws a lot on a tel teleological idea that, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat, yeah. and then when we have overthrown capitalism, we won't, no we will no longer be a proletariat because we will be communists. Right. But uh, since we could clearly say that capitalism is based on a false axiom and has nothing to do with truth, or truth even without quote unquote, yes, because it, it's based on the fact that there's endless resources and that's yes. obviously not true. And the self is is I mean, how long can the self persist in respect of the fact that capitalist ideology is based on a f fallacy? Because, I mean, I, I guess what I'm getting at is not a very yeah. <laughs> pleasant topic, but I mean, because there is also ideas of conatus or this desire and yeah. yeah. that, that keeps us moving on for some reason. Yeah. And even though we become this nostalgic, the way I perceive it, there is not a mass suicide yet. And I mean, why is, why is there no mass suicide? There's different ways of killing <laughs> yourself, though, on that. <laughs> like the... Um, um, if, if, well, if okay. we are alone together, yeah. and we could, uh, we don't know we're alone. Do we it. couldn't mobilize a mass yeah. suicide because we're not a community that could say, "Let's do it that," well, because that would that would take it, organization. We could do it via Facebook. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, okay, that's um, no. I don't think it's the same thing. I don't, I, I don't think that it's it's because one could easily imagine a scenario where. Uh, we would start to collectively organize a, a, uh, like a communal suicide because we're we're tired of this and yeah. th th it would be almost a utopian scenario where we would start to you know well if we, we the, the thing is if, if we could good the thing is if we could <laughs> set up and then we would have a community <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it the case that if we could organize for that then we wouldn't need to commit suicide because we would have the ability to organize things completely differently so mm. you know that um uh that um no, but I, I, I think what I'm suggesting is that there is a, there's a human tendency just in a, at the level of the animal towards folk psychology of, of various kinds. Um, Which entails also self-preservation. Yes, mate, and, and that's, uh, but, but then, um, which I don't think that's the same as the uh, ideological interpolation that al talks about. Uh, but clearly that, uh, that interpolation can take advantage of these already existing tendencies in 
in, in human beings. And I think this is also what you can, you can see um, Anti-Oedipus, uh, Deleuze and Guattari being about as well, where they're saying that um, why, is there a, why is there a relation between, on the one hand, this massive system of planetary destratification, which is capitalism, where you know, all the solid melts into air, everything that was previously believed is up for grabs um, and can be forgotten, dispensed with. How, how on the one hand have we got that? And on the other hand, this continuing firm belief in the, 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 the individual. How, how, why do the two things come together? Um, and, you know, it's because it seems that, because, it, because, of that, um, because of that residual kind of folk bias, I think, as it were, isn't it? That when you strip everything else away, it can, you, it can seem as if you're, st well, you're still an individual. That's what's, you know, we're still, I mean, this, isn't this what Descartes says? Isn't this, isn't this the basis and lots of ways of um, modern philosophy, as it were? That you can strip everything else away, but you're still left with reflexive subjectivity, you know? And that, that's, 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 that's irreducible, actually. You can, you can take God away, um, uh, I, uh, um, you know. Um, and I was sort of saying it yeah. when you spoke about Metzinger, but right. it was too seedless, so I refrained, but now you give me a second opportunity. Go it's on. like, Metzinger is like, the inverse Descartes saying, I think, therefore I'm not. Right, yeah, yes, um, exactly. Um, but, okay, um, hang on. But I would like to disagree about this. It's the individual and it's the capitalism. Because we also have other structures as the nation state, mm -hmm. and we have the, the global corporatives, yeah. Uh, that is also structuring the life, even though we don't like it, and even maybe we would love, love to have another vision of how to structure it. But even if it's folk psychology or mm. whatever, we need these structures or we live within them. And it's not only the two, the individual and the capitalism. And no, I, I, I but I mean, uh, can we separate the nation state from capitalism, though? I mean, like, that's it's. it's yeah, but maybe it's just carrying it out, but but still, uh, the nation state is also organizing us as individuals. So it's not it's not as I am a part of the national state either. No, I mean I agree that, and I don't. I mean I don't want to say there's only those two actors involved, but I think, um, you know, increasingly the nation state is subordinate to capitalism, isn't it? I mean, and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't can't be effectively. It can't. Be, relation that is not just uh, fluid it is uh, active in some way no no i th no i think it, that nothing is fluid but at ex ex nothing is fluid at the local level as it were but at the um you know because capitalism has to work with what's already there um but uh it's about tendency though isn't it a tendency is towards um Whilst it, you know, it just take the path of least resistance, won't it? If, if it can work with stuff that's already there, why get rid of it? Um, but, it's, it's, but everything can come back under capitalism, but it comes back in its ironic form, doesn't it? That, that OK, you, we can have religion back, but no, but no one really believes it anymore. In, in a sense that, you know, the, 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 the emergence of capitalism as such is the displacement of religion, right? You know, because that, you know, before, before capitalism, we had a, you know, what was the medieval world was theocracy, and so that meant that you know every, everything had to be compatible with with the church. I mean, that level of authoritarian um, ideological control has to be got rid of for capitalism to emerge. And so, it's not that you can't. You, you, well, of course, one can believe in religions, but the status of that belief is not the same as it was before capitalism, which has ironized it, because capitalism said you can only exist. You can, you can only exist now because. You're compatible with, with with me, and so far as it's a subject which is not. But, but so, sorry, sorry. Did you uh, did you want to come in? Because I. Uh, yeah, so. just that then. Uh, so it seems there's nothing to rely on, and uh, that that's that's mainly why the yourself is as an individual is is a an escape. And then Metzinger like brings this even further and dissolves that, so I wonder on which side he really is um, on, in dissolving categories. When, politically, you think which side is he on? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know what his ways. Uh, I, don't, I don't think. I don't think he's. A, I don't, don't think he's a right winger particularly. But that. I mean, but I mean, these are. But, but I think this is a category needs dissolving for us, you know, as it were. That um, that's. I think the power of it, particularly, the. Uh, you know, the, the the weight that science carries in our culture. You know, so when that. I mean, people are saying, oh, you know, everyone said that before there's no such thing as a self. Bart said it. You know, um, Buddhists have said it. But it actually carries different weight in our culture with scientists say, I think. You know, because science has this ideological power, um, I, I think, that um, makes things different. But I, I think we needed some a range of kind of ideological weapons against, against this idea of irreducibility of the, of the individual. And I think Smetzinger's theory is one of those. Um, another thing, and since you mentioned th that you're point about responsibility and it's all down to us and that's I, I think it's absolutely how things are operating at the moment is is th that interpolation you know it's 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 why things gone wrong it's you and in a certain sense that's not false either because part of the reason we know that um there's not a lot of point you know we can hang all the bankers that we want um it's not necessarily going to change that much you know, because we know it's not the bankers, it's not, the, it's not particular ethical failings of bankers that made the system go wrong. It's not because they were greedy and, and, you know, and, it, and we can imagine nice bankers put in their place who just behaved in a different way. And it would, it's, we know systemic tendencies of banking, it's the nature of a, a bank and its relation to, that, 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 that uh, produced this crisis, not, not particular individuals. So I think we shift responsibility of them as much as of... <laughs> of ourselves actually in, in, in this situation, which, which isn't to deny that you know, business interests have an agenda which they do pursue in a quasi-conspiratorial manner, that's, that's certainly true, but it's that, you know, um, well, this, uh, let's come back to this problem of protest and, and uh, effective strategy. This, this is the problem for me about the anti-capitalist protests is that, okay, who do you, let's say, you, why, who are you petitioning here? So we go out in the streets, you know, um, we've got a, you know, a, a carnival atmosphere. Uh, it's going really well. It's going really. Lots of people are joining in. You know, it's like uh, it's like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. More and more folk are coming in the street. You know, and it's going. Yes, capitalism really, really bad. Okay, then we go up to the the G20 and uh, and uh, the G20 go. Okay, the game's up. Uh, right, that's it. I, we agree. You've made enough noise, and actually, we want to join your party. Uh, the capitalism is miserable. And, uh, sorry. Um, then then what? Do you know what I mean? Th I mean, it's, even then what? I mean, it's not that then the problems start, right? You see, e e people can't by voluntarily get rid of capitalism because we, it's a, it's a, if it's about organisational structures, isn't it? And so it's about uh, transcendental structures and, you know, getting rid of those. So, I mean, the other side of ideology for Althusser is ritual. I mean, basically for Althusser, I think, Important notion for Althusser is that ideology is not um, beliefs in the head. And so far as it's beliefs in the head, they are effects of behaviours rather than the other way around. Um, and really it's just about, uh, what is the idea? It's about certain forms of compliance with, with, you know, with, with behaviour. And so I, as I describe in, in capitalist realism, we have this um, in, um, you know, in managers that I'd encountered. Um, and, you know, work. They they go. Well, you know, we've got this latest batch of nonsense business, uh, sort of self surveillance that you've got to do, uh, everybody. Um, now, of course, you don't have to believe in this stuff. Um, you know, it's, well, oh, but we, you know, we don't have to believe in it. You just got to do it, though. You know, that, that, you know, you've got a fifty-page logbook to fill in. You know, uh, about you know. Uh, you know, it's part of your continuous, you know, continuing personal development, that ominous phrase. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you know, you have to fill that in and, okay, uh, why, do we, why do we go along? Well, well because we have to. Um, but it doesn't really matter because none of, none of us believe in this stuff. Well, you know, the, the, the thing is the strength of, uh, one of the strengths of Zizek's analysis is to really draw attention to the way in which it does really matter. It does matter. That, um, that it matters more what we do, how we behave, and ritualistic compliance than what we believe in our heads. Because why have we got a sense that, there's no, that, that we, we can't fight business interests anymore? That no matter how much we might deplore them, nevertheless their encroachment 
into er all areas of culture, um, public services, and the psyche is inevitable. Why? Because we've mouthed this language. We've mouthed it. We've complied with it. You know, we've used this, we, we use this language. We behave as if it is, you know, it is true. And actually, the Althusser's points are borne out, I think, by um, studies of depression, and etc. Which are, uh, um, he, he, um, uh, actually, Althusser takes this from Pascal, and Pascal's uh, dictum of kneel and you will believe. Um, in other words, first of all, you perform the rituals, afterwards you'll believe in it. And um, uh, that uh, this, this is, you know, when you're dealing with severely depressed people, um, you, they're not amenable to anything. Um, you certainly can't talk to them. What, we, what you can do to get them out of that state is make them act as if what they're doing mattered. They don't think it matters. Oh, there's no point. There's absolutely, you know, what's the point? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just worthless. And even if it wasn't worthless, there's absolutely no point doing anything anyway. Whatever. But, th if you, but then if you make them go through the motions of doing things, that's possibly the only way you can get them out of that state, really. Um, and... You know, I think it's sort of that, 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 you know, we are that depressed person now, actually, in lots of ways. But, but the whole point of this preamble was that what we need is not just ideology, ideology critique, but new ideological rituals, as it were. I mean, since uh, what, is, what, is, um, what is our language to counter their language? You know, what, are our kind of, what kind of behaviours can we impose that counter the ones that are in place already? And, you know, I think we st stop being kind of, uh, um, you know, um, well, I, Jody Dean's work, I think, is very strong on this notion of um, left, leftist kind of um, <sighs> belief in openness. You know, that, uh, as Jody puts it, you know, there's this idea that um, if we just leave things open, then people automatically come around to the sort of left-wing way of thinking. Um, the, you know, he says the right wing don't believe this, particularly in the US. The right wing take advantage of democratic openness in order to propagate their agenda and to propagate in a dogmatic way. We shouldn't be fined a dogmatism. We just need the right dogmatism. You know, that, 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 um, there's the kind of, uh, you know, it, because it, was, it just totally disadvantages us. It totally disadvantages us. You know, that, the, well, they, they ruthlessly pursue the same mantras which they, uh, they uh, you know, keep. Um, imposing wherever they can, we're going, that's okay, we can be open about it, and people naturally come to believe what is the right thing. Well, they, they won't. We've seen that they don't. And even if they do at some level believe it, and that's all evidence, well, not all, like, most of the evidence we've got does suggest that people actually are, people do hold views that are broadly left of centre, actually. They do hold those, even if they hold those views, they don't believe anyone else holds them. Because why? Because the ideological atmosphere is such that that, is, that seems to be the case. And a book I strongly recommend, a recent book on this, is uh, Dan Hines' book, uh, Return of the Public, which came out on um, Verso recently. Where he, for, he describes the mechanisms of this kind of production of, of belief, actually, um, particularly through media. And that, it was Dan Hind, H-I-N-D, um, and it's called The Return of the Public. Um, what, what he's talking about is precisely this mechanism where, um, you know, most people hold these left of centre views, but they think they have no traction because nobody else has that view either. And how does this work? Well, not, not just by um, direct manipulation of public opinion, but it's by manipulation of the representation of public opinion. Um, another book important on that is, you, is from a few years ago, Nick Davis's book, Flat Earth News, a shocking book, really, about the the extent to which um, media is controlled by PR now. Um, in the UK, 60% of content of serious news, so-called serious newspapers, there's a ludicrous uh, description of these papers now, 60 it comes can be traced directly back to PR press releases. You know, it's, uh, and um, this, is the, this, the, this is the environment in which people live. It's one dominated by PR and business, the, this media environment. Great example from Heinz's book. said when, I mean, in spite of all this, most people are still skeptical about business, even in the US. You know, uh, and, and the findings show that, you know, when, it, when a study came out that showed the majority of Americans distrusted business, how was this reported? Business has a PR problem. <laughs> so it wasn't that there's actually a fucking problem with business, and that it was that uh, business hasn't.
business, poor old business, with its lack of resources and not, you know, not much access to the media and all of that kind of thing, had, had not got its message across strong enough. You know, that, um, but, you know, so I, th I think that, um, we, again, we can learn the lessons of neoliberalism. How did it, it work? Well, it didn't believe in openness of people. It believed in dogmatism, dogmatic kind of repetition. And, um, you know, and it you know, succeeded in pushing that, that, you know, it's the most successful Leninist project in the history of the world. You know, um, well, it's, you know, it's a, the cadres of think tanks, small cadre, elitist think tanks, were capable of disseminating this, the, this ideology across the world. Now, of course, you can say, well, if, you know, there's the asymmetry there. They've got, you know, interests of the wealthy and on the, 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 you know, their side. Well, OK, but we've got a majority of, you know, earth on our side. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. You know, that, um, um, but I mean, the struggle over media, in other words, is crucial. And the struggle over, you know, being able to formulate, and to, uh, formulate a, a new orthodoxy, a, a, a counter-orthodoxy to neoliberal orthodoxy. The belief that somehow just disappear of itself, that's just, that'll never happen. You know, and, you know the, how do we kill this zombie of, 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 of neoliberalism? Only by a counter-orthodoxy, I think, that, um, that you know, can be propagated through media, partly. Yeah. There's Matthew. a thing about the zombie that you mentioned in like, this uh, ritual repetition, I mean, which, of course, potentially has the effect that you can't have in just trying to convince through an argument what you're saying, right? Yes. That you would have, but that also creates this sort of zombie behavior to like, in according to like according to a better orthodoxy for sure, but nevertheless. But I think I believe out you can't step outside ideology insofar as you. I mean, this is also I think the point of Metzinger in some ways is you can't step out of, as it were, delusional beliefs in a certain way. The question is that. Um, in a way, you can one can only step outside them and not in life. And so far as you're a living being, then you are you're inside ideology. And the question is, which one are you in? And and um, as you know, Althusser yeah. says, well, it's science has no ideology, but science is then so science has no subject. But that um, that you know that gives you analytic purchase, as it were, on things. Science, but it doesn't tell you, tell you how to live. As it were, as soon as you're living, that's living subject again, or living being. Let's not say subjects; it's a bit begging the question of whether we can, oh, you know, of whether we can, and I have an ideology whether there aren't subjects at all. And I think we shouldn't beg that question. Um, but you know, I, I, I think he's right on that. And the question is then, okay, which which ideology is it to be? Sure, but I think that the repetition sort of empties out the potential meaning that you were actually looking for. We don't want meaning though. I just don't, I don't really want meaning. We just want, I mean, I, seriously, I just think we want, we just want, we just, you know, we just want things to work better. And in, in a way that, uh, that sort of politics would, in, in a way, recede into, into the background in a good way, in, in, a, in a way it does for, for neoliberals. That so then we could get on with doing the other stuff in life that we want to do, where, you know, it's a, and... But I think it has to be autonomic on that level in, in order to work. It's, just, it's overinvestment in, 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 in that kind of meaningfulness, I think, on, on our side. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, it's very interesting because um, I guess my question is very simply, do you think, because I mean, great Russia is obviously yeah. you know, now using um, as a way of understanding our world that, 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 it, that it doesn't have any meaning in itself. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's possible to draw from this conclusion a political perspective in which might be, you know, bring, bringing back this kind of very negative or what is now supposed to be negative, you know, perspectives on the world or what are our role here? Like, do you think we can, yeah, basically produce some politics out of this? I'm, I, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a direct relation. I think there's some, some, of, the things that, some of the things that Ray's interested in. I think, such as Metzinger, as I said, I think there is, example, there is a relation, I think, to politics. Metzinger, in some ways, is doing the work that uh, Marx did with the commodity form, which is right, okay. looking through the, what it appears to be. Right, okay, yeah. Dismantling. Right, yeah. And this is what we need, you know, like, not uh, something that is based on a set of beliefs, or that we live our life according to a set of beliefs that are folk, as we're 
talking about the fidelity. Yeah, I think that dimension is that's what I'm. That's the way I'm going with, with Ray's themes. Is this? It's, it's not me. It's just me. It's also, as I said, each, um, there's, there's um, a couple of other younger theorists, Alex Williams and Nick Strakak, are writing a little book called Folk Politics at the Moment, where they're trying to use these ideas which they've, you know, they've got from Ray ultimately. But it's not only Ray. It's also Jameson, and um, you know, Jameson's, Jameson's essay, Cognitive Mapping, which you've, uh, is very good. Um, it's, it's online. Um, you know, just about it is it is about this issue of how do how would it's partly an aesthetic problem for Jameson, which is how do we produce an image of capitalism? But you know, because since we've got since it is this abstract global um, process, you know, we, 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 there's a paucity of, of imagery there that which we can call upon in order to um, produce any kind of uh, sense of what it is. Um, Alberto Toscano um, has done work on um, The Wire, you know, as, as being an attempt at cognitive mapping, you know, the, the, the TV series, The Wire. Um, it, and it's it actually, it, if you want to get close to what, um, if you want to get close to what, um, any sense of what capitalism is, you need something of that scale. You need five series. <laughs> You know, I mean, this is the equivalent of what the mapping of Victorian capitalism in novels, wasn't it? You could do it in novels in, the, in those days. Now you need something of that scale, you know, to show the commodity train, to child trails, to show the connections between, you know, um, container ports um, on, on the one hand, the, you know, the um, disintegration of labour, drug economies, all of this. Um, you know, you need some of that scale, of that length, in order to get close to this, because it, you can't be apprehended in any quick way, um, but um, so you know, so, so I think this this problem of the di I think what Ray's work brings out is this old Kantian problem. I think of the disjunct between what we know to be true, what we know to be true, and what we and what is livable, as it were. And like Ray, Ray says, why should we be on the side of life always? You know, why should we? Why should, we might you know in life we might have to be on that side, but why should thought be on the side of life, as it were? Um, but, you know, the thought just limits. You know, um, thought is limited by the interests of life, which are you know involve things like cognitus, etc., which is you know that, and you know so I mean so race projects to aggravate this kind of enlightenment trauma, I think, which is, is precisely based in that thing that we the, that folk categories which we've got, which we depend on, which we in fact cannot seem to do without, um, in certainly in the near future, um, ha have no relation to how things actually are. And at you know the level of um, matter, if you want to um, use that term, which is multiply contested, obviously. But um, and that okay. Now, in terms of relation to politics, okay. Um, I think one relation to it, one relation is to do with the most pressing political problem we've got, uh, which is the environmental crisis, isn't it? But uh, um, as it were, that. Um, we can we can see the problems of the persist of of folk of the persistence of folk categories extremely clearly in relation to um, environmental catastrophe, right? But I mean, I think Shishak again puts this very well when he says, "Look, the reason why we can't believe in environmental disasters is they just they just go against all of our folk folk phenomenological experience." You know that um, you know you, you sort of because there's there's no way of connecting up um, in terms of your experience. Um, you know, you turning a kettle on and, and polar ice caps melting. You can do it cognitively. We can all do it cognitively, but in our ex we, there's nothing in our experience corresponds to this. Okay, and then this poses a problem also of, which I think is also posed by capitalism, and this is what sort of Alex and, and Nick are working on their um, stuff, is that there's never been an agent there's never been an age in the history of Earth that can deal with this problem. The problems we're facing require an agent that has never existed before, right? You know, c collective human agency. Such agency has never, <laughs> never ever existed. You know, um, and this is the challenge that we now face. We, and that, you know, we can, unless we construct that agent, then surely our, we, we know we're heading for disaster. Again, we know it. 
We don't feel it. Look outside, it well looks sunshine and still, you know, that's, it looks fine, you know, and um, you, because, you know, and, and I think, you know, Zizek is right that the only point at which we believe the catastrophe has happened is after it's happened, you know, and then it's too late. And th that's why he uses th this thing, uh, Pierre de Poy, is interesting um, uh, c conjecture that the only way we'll deal with uh, environmental catastrophe is we have to put ourselves in a position where it's already happening and think what we would have done to have avoided it. And that's, it's so, it's just make a lot of sense to me this, actually. That, and unless, that is the power of things like The Road, I think. Which, um, you know, these films which you think, oh my God, if it gets that, what, quick, run out of the cinema, what can we do to stop this happening? You know, that um, unless you, but you know, that you can see the scale, of, there's all kinds of problems here, can't we? You can see the, the we can see that, that, that there's no more pressing problem than dealing with um, the, the environmental issues. Yet the kind of feelings of despair and hopelessness that we, that we feel in relation to that. We all know it's pressing, we all know, we, we all feel that nothing can be done, or that very limited things can be done. Um, this That's why in the same time, I think Shishik paraphrases Marx, yep. saying ecology is the new opium for the masses. Right, because there are different ways that we can run out of the cinema. Right. So it can also keep us busy, you know, buying eco diapers. Well, yeah, exactly. That, again, if we, if, but it, the problem is that as, as someone to try and bring out in capitalist realism, if we take, if we come at this issue of responsibility, if we now as individuals take responsibility for it, this will mean that, that the agent required in order th that could be responsible to deal with it will never be created. You know, I think that's the point, isn't it? That, that the actions of individuals will never resolve the, r r this environmental crisis. And, you know, it requires, you know, uh, a collective human agency to be asserted. And so it's not, no, it's that no one is responsible for it. And, and that, uh, because there isn't an agent that could do anything about it yet. We're only responsible for it as far as we haven't created that agent, not directly responsible now in terms of, you know, as I mentioned in the book, I mean, the, the, this whole agenda of recycling is really so that corporate problems become our responsibility, you know, that, um, yeah. I think it ties back to what you were saying earlier. The reason we're nostalgic about Ford is capitalism, yes. or that we say it's the same financial capitalism as it used to be, is that we're not nostalgic about forest capitalism per se because it was miserable. We're, we're nostalgic for a time when we had collective passion. Yes. Uh, and the thing exactly. is that we knew what produced that collective passion. It was the, the factory and the Communist Party. Right. And for, for whatever problems they had, they did that. They produced uh, a yep. collective agent. And what is the machine? We know what the neoliberal machine is. It's yep. owning your house and it's... Yep. And what is the machine that is capable of producing a collectivity? that can relate to this. Yeah, exactly. This is if you have all the key questions. Yeah, the right. That is, I mean, that, that, is, that is it, isn't it? That, um, um, well, hold on, I just wanted to pick on something initially said. Um, and what do you first say? Sorry, I'm just, uh, what do you just No, I, I said that we're nostalgic about... Oh, you know, nostalgia, yeah, nostalgia, nostalgia, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I mean, so what you were saying there is sort of my answer to this question about um, the um, sort of meaning, etc. You know, that you posed that actually, in a, in a way, like you know, the, these sort of boring things, the, the, the uh, certain kind of boring institutions or whatever, were preconditions for other ex other interesting stuff to happen. I think in life, so we, that that that's what we need in place. It's, it's these um, something that is taken for granted in that sense, boring. That you know, but that allows us to do other stuff. I mean, that, and, and, and yeah, yeah, so, 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 I just thought that, that, yeah. that it becomes like a sort of a, a condition, like psychologically, of, of the same thing. If, uh, you know, that, that other stuff that you do when the structure is set that is a better structure, that other stuff is also affected by that you <coughs> have. Uh, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, but it's. It, it doesn't sort of have to be that way, and I think that's sort of. I think that's right about why there's something in, in Fordism to be learned from. Is that you know you, um, you could have fairly drab bureaucracies, you could have fairly boring political meetings or whatever, but the, but but they allowed people to do other things, 
and, and I think what I was going to get onto today, but it's still on the first slide, but good. And we can, <laughs> we, can, we can do this tomorrow, it doesn't, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But um, that is that we have no time to do anything now. And this, this, I think that's what Brarardi's work brings out really strongly. That it's not, every, work, work invades everything. And it's, but it's worse than that even. Is that work commandeers libido in this disturbing way. That, um, you know, okay, do you want to stop now, Bruno? No, just finish your... Okay, so what is the, what is the uh, you know, uh, what is our excuse for endlessly checking our emails? Oh, well, you know, it's work. And, and also this entre ruthless entrepreneurial spirit, like, uh, well, there might be some offer come in here that, uh, that, uh, that, that I'll miss if I don't check it this, 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 this second, you know. Uh, and um, so th th this fusion of, of, of libido and work, um, this endless superego demand that uh, we keep doing this, th there's a horrible, horrible synergy, isn't it, that we're now living in, where it's like, it's like, it's like the autonomous... The, the, the autonomous vision of freedom from uh, bosses, bureaucrats. It's an infernal inversion of that, isn't it? <laughs> Where we're, we're never free of work ever. Or the situationist dream of enchantment of everyday life. It's, a total, it's like the infernal n inversion of that. Where, you know, that uh, libido is, everyday life is saturated with libido. But libido that makes us miserable. Um, and we don't, even, we, we don't even particularly notice how miserable we are until we reflect on it.